I, I'm going to tell a little bit about kind of how I got interested and into food, uh, why I think it's so important, um, and about, yeah, we have a, a social enterprise, the food cabinet, which is um, very much trying to help in a transition kind of to new, f or yeah, help, help to create a new food system, because we believe that the food system as it is now um, has really reached its borders. But I'll be talking about that, um, and I really want to hear all about your thoughts. Um, to start off with, I have a very English accent. That's because I was born in England. And it's always a bit problematic when I just get to England that my brain still works in Dutch. But I kind of sound fluent. There's people who always think, why, is he, why does he tremble? And why is he, why is he taking his time? To, but I always kind of have to still do the translation from Dutch to English. But I was raised, um, I was born in England. My grandparents had a, a lived in Cornwall, and that's where I got, where I started to get really interested in food because my granddad, my granddad had a very big garden, and my whole family was really into cooking. So all of, all of my time that I spent there, we were always busy with collecting food from the garden. My grandfather had a very nice uh, greenhouse where he had tomatoes and red peppers and all the kind of stuff that you. As a kid, yeah, it's great to see how, how stuff grows. He would have all the herbs. Um, if we wanted to eat fish, we would go to the harbour and collect fish from the fishermen who had just come in with their boats. And for me, there kind of that was a. As a kid, I got started to be really interested in food. And my the thing I said always said that I want to be a chef. Um, and that, I st I still say that actually. Um, <laughs> and um, maybe one day again, I will be a chef. Um, but um, so I was, I was always really into food, and for me, um, although I think that was a bit simplified, kind of, it is how kind of what maybe the dreamt food system would be like. Um, but then we moved to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam, to a big town, and food was something totally different. My parents had a, both had a very busy job. There was hardly any time. Actually, in that that was the time. Uh, it was the uh, early 90s and 80s where all of the local shops were uh, really driven away because the supermarkets were kind of dominating the, 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 the streets. People were, my, also my parents would yeah, go do their shopping once a week. There wasn't a fish shop, but there was definitely no fish fisherman who had a boat in the harbour. And for me that kind of really got me thinking about, yeah, what the whole kind of idyllic food system that I knew and kind of the food as I loved it was not there anymore. It was totally different. Um, and when I was 19, 18, 19, I had this choice. I'd always said I wanted to become a chef. Uh, but at the same time, I was also really interested in kind of the more uh, social side of kind of how, yeah, how do we create a food system and the policies around food and everything that was uh, about it. Um, and then as I'm not very good in choosing, I decided to do both. So I said, all right, I'm going to go uh, and work in the kitchen for a year. And then after that, I will start my studies. Um, and I turned out to be a very bad student because I really enjoyed my work as a chef. Um, but while I was working in the kitchen, I also started noticing that um, the people in the kitchen were working with food every day, but weren't the, the kind of the main thing that we were doing was turning good products, nice products into food that we would sell for a lot of money, but we weren't really thinking about where the food came from, why we were paying the price that we were paying. Um, and I was starting to ask myself questions about kind of what am I doing here and what, what are the choices I'm making. At the same time, I was uh, studying political science and we were talking about uh, European, uh, the, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, talking about how we could transform policies into more kind of pressing, or pressing sustainability. Um, and all these people who were talking about agriculture and about food, the food system actually didn't really know a lot about food. They were talking about all these theories. Um, and while, while, I, while we were doing this, at the one hand, I was start, starting to change the way I cooked because I thought it was interesting to spend more time with the farmers that we bought our stuff. To, to really ask them questions. Um, and then in, in the, um, well, in this kind of settings, we were talking about the, the sustainability of the food system and how we, on the one hand, created a very efficient food system in the way that we 
feed some people in the world very efficiently. We have create f the cheap food, but it's not sustainable in many ways. And I think I won't go into that very fastly because I think most people kind of know the issues. And um, one of the models that, that I looked at a lot was, I don't know, do you, do you does it, is this a familiar model here? The, yeah, it's a, the transition uh, model. And it's uh, one of the professors who was one of the, my teacher. Um, he was always working and to show me this model. And it's basically what he said is um, the world, there's in policy and in looking at the world, and we, there's three different levels. Um, and if we want to change the, the system, we should be using this model to work or to, to create the change. And for me at that time, it was, enough, it was just one of the models that, that I looked at and looked at again. And he asked me questions and I filled in the right answers and I would pass my exam. But later, later in my work, this is actually really what I did. Um, and I just want to explain what, what this model is about. It's um, basically what he said is this is, a, this is the regime. This is a, the world as it is with all its institutions, with all the... Um, people who try to keep the system as it is because they profit from it or because they uh, have an uh, important role in it. Um, but at the same time, the world is changing and the people in the system are trying to pretend or are pretending the world isn't changing or be believe the world isn't changing, but actually the world is changing. And for instance, we know that, that um, uh, resources are running out and this is not fit for this change here. And what he said, always said is, so there's a lot of technological, but also social niches, people working on new ideas and showing um, and inspiring this regime to maybe change. And the, he had like different theories. So he said, well, to change, we could, some people want to really just kick the whole system out and say, we don't believe in the system or we're gonna, within these niches, build a new system. And other people say, although, this system is uh, trying to pr kind of keep the power and to keep the world as it is. Uh, they can be inspired by these little by little projects, and they can be uh, they can be uh, grassroots projects trying to press for different things. They can they can just people working on on new ideas, new ways of doing stuff. But they, and they can really inspire a, a system and. By connecting people who have new ideas to the system, we will, in the end, change the system. And maybe we will find out that it won't go fast enough and we have to rebuild uh, this food system, which isn't working. But it could also just, we can definitely inspire a system in a good way. Um, and, and while I was thinking about this, um, I, I always show this picture because I think that the food system is road um, and uh, it might be Tim is this maybe this is actually something that, that you once had as a I don't know there was I, I remember someone telling me showing kind of how the food system has been built it was a very efficient food system like the way we built roads but now it although it was very efficient um, it has clogged and it's not working anymore so we really need to rebuild it um, and as a student, a chef, um, I found it really hard that whenever I was going to um, debates about kind of how to rebuild this food system in the Netherlands, there was also always the same people sitting there. There were often they were, um, uh, and no offence, but they were often people, quite old people, talking together, and I was really kind of amazed that there was hardly any youth at that time in the Netherlands at all who was interested in the topic. Um, so at that point, I decided that I really wanted to create a, a, a young network of people from in the system, from without, outside of the system with new ideas, um, and see if we could build like a, a network of people who can rethink the food system. Um, because I really believe that um, you need, what? Oh, sorry. 
Sebastian always says I can't click up and go up, uh, up in front of the go up and down in the presentation. Um, but I really believe we need uh, uh, all the different experts from different levels. I really believe that we need people from NGOs to work together with people in big retail, in big companies, if we want to make change. Um, so we started the network uh, and uh, the youth food movement, and we started our own acad academy in which we uh, in, try to train 25 young people every year to, talk, to rethink the food system and work in new ways uh, to change things. Um, that academy uh, kind of teaches people who work for big supermarket chains um, together with people who are working as policy advisors for the uh, Dutch um, food, and kind of the food and Agricultural Ministry um, together with young uh, people working with NGOs and we try to kind of get them to step outside of their the world that they work in every day and to rethink what they are doing um, and that was really successful and we had a really interesting network that I didn't have before because before I was working as a chef but I was never really talking to people who were working as a farmer or I was never really talking to the people who were working as a, a, a policy maker in, in The Hague who were actually, yeah, really involved in, in the same system, but I never spoke to them. Um, and that kind of opened my eyes. And after a while, I stopped working with the YFM, and we started this uh, social, social enterprise where we try, what we try to do is really build these niches that inspire people to look in different ways. Because, I re yeah, kind of you can... Um, we can talk about things, but I really have a, a deep belief in that if we show people that we can, can change things and that we can organise stuff in the other way, it can kind of, yeah, it, it, it can help build the transition that we need. Um, and that is what I want, I actually want to talk about two of the projects that we've been doing recently. Um, and I think that will, um, yeah, that can maybe show you how, how these things work. Um, and so we, we've done a lot of different projects and at, at, this, at the moment we are working on a lot of them, on, on a lot of different projects. Um, some of them are our own projects and they often, um, we often start them because we get angry about something or we are really irritated about a company doing bad stuff or because we really feel like starting up, setting up a pop-up restaurant or but it's, they are our own projects and sometimes we are hired because the company says, yeah, we're really finding it really hard to um, get something done. And outside of the organisation, we want someone to show our staff or our team that it can be done. So um, two of the projects that we've been working on, one, uh, one is food waste. Um, and I was in many discussions with a lot of people about what needs to be done to create a, a, a more sustainable food system. And there's often a lot of arguments about what the right path is that we should be walking. Um, some, people, uh, some, some people say, yeah, it's all about organic uh, production. Other people say, yeah, it's all about technology. And kind of people can get in, into these debates and kind of will never find each other because they don't believe in the, in, in the same thing, and that's fine. Because, I, um, but there's food. Then there's the food waste topic, and what I found is that this is one of the topics that, although there's a lot of people who also have a little bit of other kind of beliefs, it's really hard to say that you think that food waste is something that is okay. So, food waste was one of the topics that I thought we should really kind of get stuff going in the Netherlands. And we worked together with um, Tristram Stewart, who you probably all know? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's the London uh, food waste campaigner. Um, and in the Netherlands, th there wasn't anything going on at all. And so we, we worked together with him to organize a really big uh, dinner uh, in, in Amsterdam. We had fed like se nearly 7,000 people on the museum plane. We organized a, a big dinner of food waste. Um, we got a lot of press attention, which m then what happened is that the Dutch Minister of Agriculture said, this is one of the topics that we should be really should be pressing. Um, that was all great, but what also happened is that 
a lot of new initiatives started on the on the um, uh, on the topic, and me and Tristan went to one of the big supermarkets and said, "Hey, is this something? That, wh what are you doing about the food food waste? Because you have a lot of influence. You're feeding about 40 or 30 percent of the of the Netherlands, um, and and you are also wasting a lot of food. And it was one of the organisations of which I thought that would never give in or do anything, but they were actually really inspired because they saw that they, that 7,000 people could be brought together on a subject which is actually one of the things, yeah, they, they are one of the big creators of the waste. Um, and then uh, not long after we were asked to talk to some of the young people and we started a restaurant uh, in stock which actually works with the waste from the supermarkets um, and sells that for a, a, a really fair price and with the money that is um, uh, that is being made, then people at the food, food bank um, are also invited to come dinner, to have dinner at their restaurant. Um, and they started with one pop-up restaurant, and I was still a bit sceptic at that time because I thought it's just like one small uh, thing and it's not going to change a lot. But now they've got three of these restaurants, and I think it is actually showing that the big companies um, can be inspired to also uh, work on, on these kind of topics and do stuff. Um, while we were working on this, we were, I also have a sausage, I have a sausage making, uh, art artisanal sausage making factory and that again is really inspired me and at the moment we are working on a new project where we are again with Albert Hain who was one of the, um, the that was the big supermarket that, who was also interested in the uh, restaurant. Um, we are now looking at how we can start a small pig farm on the edge of the city. Um, again, we are working with Tristan Stewart on this one um, to see if we can kind of really feed pigs and create a new kind of urban agricultural set, uh, uh, urban agriculture concept where we can feed pigs on the waste, which is not a really a new thing at all because it's something that it's the way ha that we used to um, raise pigs. Um, and I'm, this is one of the projects that we will be working on the coming year. I really feel really excited about because I, I think there's a lot of chances. Then, um, I'm gonna just take a second of, uh, um, <laughs> take a second. Um, another project that, that was very important, I think, for what we've been doing over the last year is, um, that me and Sebastian, we were talking about kind of what really bothers us. And over the last years, we've been uh, asked to think with the city council a lot about how we can educate children to eat healthier. Um, we, uh, there's a lot of money being spent on kind of change the way people eat because we have a lot of a big problem, as you have here in the UK, with uh, people who have yeah, kind of unhealthy diets that are leading to overweight, obesity um, and all the, yeah, everything that comes with unhealthy diets. And while we were talking about what we could do um, and how kind of also the, the, if you look at who is eating well, it's often the rich people. And in, I live in a quite, uh, in a, not one of the best neighborhoods in Amsterdam. And you just see that the kids there are, yeah, eating bad stuff. So when my, I've got two little boys who I play football with every weekend, we just go, play, go outside and they often come outside with a, literally with an energy drink and a packet of crisps. That's their, um, that's their breakfast. And, and we were really pissed off about that. If you think about kind of how money is being put in to get people to eat healthy, at the same time, the, there's a lot more money being put in to get people to eat unhealthy. And um, I think it's, it's in the West Europe, it's more than seven billion a year on the marketing of food that we actually shouldn't be eating. Um, and we, me and Sebastian were invited to come to a football stadium because there was a big congress about how can we get people to eat more fruit and veg and how can we get people to eat, yeah, how can we change people's diets. And while we, while we were sitting there, um, and it was like about 100 and I think it must have been about 150 farmers and policy makers and 
a lot of people kind of really with the best intentions were sitting there and we were listening to the story about from a, a broccoli farmer who was saying yeah, we should um, get people to eat more veg and in the corners in every corner of the the big uh, what was it a big conference hall that we were sitting there with massive big screens showing Burger King advertisements and it was like I felt like I was I actually felt like that someone do you have candid camera is that a program that yeah the kind of where they have a camera and to, that I really had the thought that we that we were being taken the piss out of because um, there was all of these people there was mo a lot of money being put into the uh, to this conference and basically if you would close your eyes you would see a Burger King Burger King advertisement um, so and that really me and Sebastian had started the conversation and we said well if there's something that we could do now how could we um, get people to look at the way that kind of this, there's always this discussion in the Netherlands people say yeah the government shouldn't be interfering w with what we eat um, and the, and every time that we say yeah maybe there should be a food policy and we should try to get people to eat healthier one of the answers that we get or one of the things that people say is no uh, the market will regulate what we eat and regulates its choice and then I think yeah what well, so how come every time we say that the government should interfere people say it's a bad thing and then at the same time whenever I look at a football match uh, when I go to the cinema wherever I go it's food industry really pushing bad diets so why is that like why can they do that and why can't government tell us what we should eat so we were talking about how maybe selling fruit and veg could be a social campaign and how we could start this ourselves and do something to show that we could can maybe yeah get people to think different about this um, and we started looking into kind of what is do being done in the Netherlands to get how yeah to get people to eat health more healthy and we walk, basically it's all about kind of really boring campaigns and there's there's a lot of money being spent on good kind of yeah uh, anti-obesity uh, interventions and programs on schools all good but at the same time the the um, campaigns that are being done are really really boring so we said why can't we do a really cool vegetable campaign why can't we come up with a plan and use all the ingredients that the big marketing uh, agencies that are being hired by the coca-colas and the marses um, how could we do that and we came up with a plan and we said all right we're gonna look for a vegetable that is going to be our hero um, and really build a campaign and see what that does and I'm going to show you this video we are living in times in which you can design your life one swipe or tweet can unchain a revolution truth and information were never so accessible at the same time, we were never surrounded with so many lies. It is money that decides which stories get told. Often, the truth doesn't get sold because it has got no logo, no commercial. So, we took on a challenge. We gathered the world's smartest advertising companies to tell the truth and design a story. The outcome is this commercial. It's the best a man can get. The fresh maker that is so finger-licking good that it melts in your mouth, not in your hands. Have it your way. Open happiness. Look in the mirror and say, I'm loving it. It's time to have a break from all the crap. Just do it. Because it is time to think different about what we eat. Break free. Eat broccoli. Um, and this really kind of changed within a couple of weeks. This was all over kind of Dutch news. It was in all the newspapers. And there was a whole conversation started about kind of 
why, why, why is there no campaigns for fresh food, for good, good yeah, kind of pressing good diets? And why are we not a lot stricter about kind of what we are showing to kids and during football matches, which should be about kind of getting people to be more healthy and not about eating more Mars bars and drink more Coca-Cola. Um, and for, for us, this was really a, a, one of the examples of the, one of the projects that was, for us, this was like a really small thing that started off as a really small thing, but the effect was really big because um, not only a lot of people were talking about it, it was also the whole fruit and veg sector would coming together and saying, hey, maybe we should now, because when, when we started this, um, campaign. I actually went to a broccoli grower and I said, hey, could you, a big bro broccoli bro grower, and told them that this was actually not really about broccoli, but it was about a broader thing, but maybe he could, maybe he would have some money spare to get this vi video uh, made. And he said, no, sorry, because if I'm going to spend money on promote, promotion of broccoli, I'm only one broccoli grower, and there's a lot of more broccoli growers. And we're not really... Um, I'm not really working together with them, so if you're promoting broccoli, um, they will also be kind of, they will, yeah, they will have um, the benefits, yeah. Um, so I said, all right, there's, he said, but there is a broccoli group of broccoli growers in the north, maybe you, you can ask them. So we went to them and said, um, if we are going to do this, do you maybe have a thousand euros to help us with this campaign? And they said, no, because there's also a group of broccoli growers in the south. <laughs> And if we are going to give, give you the money, they will also benefit from this whole thing. And so I was then trying to explain to them that um, it wasn't really about the broccoli, and it, but it would be good for the broccoli sales maybe. And they, and they said, no, 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 we're really not going to do this. And I, I think that's really, that shows kind of how um, in the Netherlands, the, the growers and the farmers are really not working together to actually press healthy food. Um, and so what happened then is that we started talking to some people and now there are actually a couple of organisations working together and saying, hey, maybe we should try to um, promote fruit and veg and try to get money together and yeah, try to really do this in a, in a new way. Um, this is just the last picture, us looking really happy because we managed to get um, one of the big po poster Kind of they have all the bus um, houses in Amsterdam. We got them to, uh, yeah, we, I think they gave us like 15 or 10 of these bus houses and we could stick in our photos. So then our campaign was really perfect. That was kind of the thing I always had thought of, kind of if Coca-Cola, normally this is filled by Coca-Cola and Mars bars, maybe we can get a broccoli and <laughs> promote the broccoli in the Dutch... Um, yeah, in the Dutch tram stations. Basically, this is my talk. Um, I uh, went through it quite fast. And I hope kind of it, I hope it's a, a, a good discussion starter. Sebastian, do you want to come up? Um, this is Sebastian Alst, who, as you could hear from lots of plugs from Sam, uh, like him, a graduate of Amsterdam University, but like him, um, basically working on these sort of campaigns and trying to change culture. I mean, can I kick it off? Yes, it, it seemed to me, am I getting you right? You started with youth, but you're yeah. actually ending up with saying, we've got to divide industry. I'm going to push you. Good industry, mm -hmm. bad industry. Um, have you left youth? Does that seem that's not s still quite your same focus? This is Dutch society uh, in its entirety. And in the end here, you were talking about the most powerful industry of all, the advertising industry. Yeah. And in methods terms, I'm sure you know this, uh, you will have probably studied it at Amsterdam, um, this is subterfizing, subter, I'm sorry, I can never say the word, advertising, but subverting yeah. advertising. Um, do you think that is the way we should go? Do you think that's just a catchy way to do it? It was a wonderful way for you to launch your campaign. Um, uh, can you really take over the advertising industry, 7 billion euros? I mean, this is I've, massive. 
let me start off with the first question um, about the youth. Yeah. When we, I think I still really believe, believe in the power of the youth because I think by getting young people in really in the beginning of their careers to look at what the real problems are, yeah. you make them responsible for the rest of their career yeah. and make them responsible to make the right choices. And I think um, often people are trained to think in one way and to look at one thing and what we try to do and still try to do with the youth food movement is really broaden people's perspective and make them look, make them responsible not only for their daily, what they do on a daily basis, but for the company that they work for. So are you still doing the film <coughs> festival? Has anyone here been to the Amsterdam Food Film Festival? Yorick, of course. Yeah, Actually, of course. I have to, I have to say you that we... It. Well, I, I stopped the Food Film Festival and the um, last year we had a really bad year so we had a big financial problem so, maybe, so uh, don't feel no we've, but um, we but, should all talk about our financial yeah. disasters <laughs> no There's so no problem you're on <laughs> many of us have been there but the point is did it i mean as i saw it it was start you started small maybe yeah. three four five hundred and then it was 7, it grew 000. too big it grew, it grew uh, very yeah big. so it grew to ten thousand and then it collapsed yeah That's what happened. does that matter i don't think that matters personally. no but i still f so that that has to do with what we're, we're not work, I'm not working for the YFM Academy anymore, but it still exists and it's popular, more popular than ever. And I really believe that by showing people what is going on and showing consumers um, that with what they buy, they are actually choosing for which system they are supporting, um, that, that really works because it's, although consumers are not kind of unified in some kind of way, it is the only baggage that we can give them yeah, to make the choices. Take you back to your beginning, your beginning motivation. And when I met you years ago, it was all about change. I mean, that's yeah. the, the graph had it. Do you want to come in and then we've got our first question? You, you're not wired up, so you've got to hold this. <laughs> you have to hold it. Yeah, you want me to, to react on your second yeah. question? Yeah. I think that um, it was, the question was, if I I'm reminded well, if we really believe we can take over the advertising yes. companies and turn them into... There's some big politics there. Yeah. Actually, I don't believe so. But I do believe that by this campaign, we, sh we made people at least a bit more aware of the choice editing that is going on all the time, how they are being trained to, to react in a certain way and to how they how, how use their use there are to all the slogans and like everybody knows all the slogans that are in this commercial so I think that's quite I confronting to did you like the advert? <laughs> I mean you could tell they loved it you know you knew that and so, so there I think those are the two most important things so uh, one thing is I hope we made people more aware of the, of the impact of advertising and the second one is that as Sam will told a, a lot of like green, greens and vegetable organizations and companies are starting to work together. So at least there is some, there are some other advertising for good products as well. So yeah, no, that's good. Let's let's take it over here. I feel a little bit running around. You have to say who you are and practice your Dutch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Jorik Brands, a uh, student here at the Center Food Policy, Tim de Martin. And I'm Dutch, so I know a little bit about what you guys are doing mm. as well. Uh, and that's why I kick off, so it's easier for the rest to still go afterwards. Uh, I've got a question concerning the YFM, actually, what you set up uh, in back in 2008, 2009. And I think that the academy that you started has been a great success in the Netherlands. Um, what is now has been, I mean, I've worked a bit for the YFM in Italy, and what has been really important is the, f the setting up of a format, because the Netherlands is just like a small country in the whole world, and just 25 people a year doesn't sound like that much, but of course the, the rollout is bigger. And to set up a format like this that can be exported to other countries, in the, in the case of youth, but it can be also within food cabinet, with, within whatever you're doing. I mean, now the, this academy has been set up even in Africa, uh, or they're busy now in Kenya, they're busy in the United States to do this same kind of idea. Do you think that's the power as well of youth to set up a format in the case of the Netherlands and try to export it to other, to other countries? Is there some chance to have this yeah. greater rollout, let's say? Yeah, so actually I think the youth food movement is one of the, is now, we, I think there's youth food movements in 
20 or 30 countries, no, countries no. so it shows how kind of... A not in Britain. There was one, but it actually there was I internal fights and uh, things, and then I think that stopped, so now they have to... Why? Re- maybe we should talk about that. For the food research collaboration, that may be something of interest. Yeah, but, uh, but can I... So um, I think the academy, why it, was, why it is more than only the 25 people is because there was a really uh, strong selection on who we wanted in the programme. There was every year we have more than, more than 150 uh, people who apply, uh, but we make a selection of people who we actually think that in their later career can make a change. And now if you look at who are, um, who are over, I think it's now the fifth or the sixth year, so it's only, well, it's only 150 people, but the, the, the first pol- policy advisor of the uh, Dutch minister is, has done the academy. Uh, people in the in management of the like Ahold have done the academy. Do you want so to say, does everyone know what the the, 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 the YFM academy? So that yeah, what say what the YFM so, academy does? Yeah, so what do, we do does is everyone know? it's a it's you a, a program know. of a year where we get people. We invite. Okay, it's basically what we're doing here. We're talking about different subjects, but we're also taking them to sit to farms, to factories with kind of really getting people to go into the food system. And if you're working on a farm, maybe it's, it's time to talk to uh, someone do, who is an expert in marketing or someone who's talking about, talking about and thinking about agriculture. So, it so it's really, a, it's like a, a school. It's like a... Is it, and is it organised? Do they come? Yeah. Is it all in Amsterdam? Who funds it? It's, is it weekly? You know, yeah. chefs, they, do they come in the morning? It's it's a it's a it's um it's about ten it's about ten weekends in a year. Ah. Uh, We have a a kind of a trip, so they go abroad together. Um, It's also really get about getting people to know each other, Um, and uh, we have different themes. So we could have a day a a weekend about fishery. It could be a weekend about farming. It could be about weekend about uh, gastronomy. Kind of in the uh, get people to cook. There's there's different themes throughout the year where we get top thinkers and speakers to come and talk with, with, with the group, but we also get the group to really do things. So um, in the beginning, oh, it's, it's funded by partly, used to be funded by Oxfam Novib, partly um, Dutch Ministry of Agriculture and Slow Food. Um, but now it is, I think, Slow Food. And because there was no more funding in the time that I was there, we had... Um, uh, we started to do business cases, so we had a group of young people thinking for um, it could be uh, for World what's it WWF or who had like a, a case and they would work on it and that would make sure that we got the funding. Sebastian, do you want to come in on the academy? Yeah, ac- actually, that was what I wanted to add. So the, they're working on real questions from real companies or NGOs, and that I think that's really. It only didn't only made the academy financially sustainable. It really adds to the importance and the, the learning of the people attending. And, uh, uh, without going on too much about it, because we can find out more. There's a website. Uh, yeah. How many people come on the academy? Is it 20 a year? Yeah, tw- 20, a year? Tw- 25, 25 maximum. Um, so it, yes, it has, it has been here now for six years. The new group just started, so the, the the opening was two weeks ago. So, and the uh, kind of the idea was when we started it that it would be good to have people in positions that, for instance, people who have done a course here, I would trust more to do their job well if it's about food policy than someone who would be in a regular, not food, um, uh, orientated policy class. So we were really trying to get people to think about food in a different way. Yeah. And maybe because, yes, Samuel started the youth food movement six years ago, the academy was, was a success. A, a lot of, some of them moved to really like interesting positions so they can change the system from within. But I think what we're trying to do as well with Food Cabinet is trying to make it possible for young people to start a professional career in food. So we have, uh, 10 full-time jobs now 
and we try to to expand it not not only to grow as as a co as a as a company but also to make it possible for more young people to to have a perspective on a real real uh, job because till a couple of years ago that was really missing in the Netherlands and I guess it's 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 the same here that there are a lot of young people really interesting in the topics but when they have to but when they have to pay the bills they have to choose for, to do something else so. I'm sure people know there's a very interesting process actually beginning again in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, I was just looking at my diary. I'm going to a meeting in, uh, uh, I think it's Utrecht, I can't remember where, but in, in the middle of March. Uh, a year ago, two years ago, the Dutch Council of Scientific Advisors produced a big report, I'm sure you know, it, basically saying the Netherlands ought to have a food policy. Yeah. And so th this movement is part of that pushing for that, yeah. and there's a sort of return of interest to that, despite lots of changes um, changes in the government. So it's a very interesting process. Martin, you wanted to come in, but also we'll ask you. I'm interested in... You say who you are. Yeah, I'm Martin Carraher from the Centre for Food Policy. Thank you. It's, it's very interesting. I mean, I think the, the issue of money has been repeated in a number, a number of other seminars we've had here with... with people in a similar British situation, you know, money comes, money goes, and that's a, a real problem for groups like yours. I mean, I was in Amsterdam in September with, with Sebastian and, and Karst. I mean, it was great. And what struck me was the style issue, that you'd done everything with style. It wasn't just doing a couple of things, but it was also a cultural engagement with a number of top chefs. I had two of the best meals I've ever had, <laughs> one in a car park in a pop-up restaurant. I mean, it was just amazing. And the thing that struck me was we talk about local food, and I was, I was very amazed that people were doing things like, things like soya sauce, Samuel, were produced in the Netherlands from local ingredients. They weren't just, you know, it was, in a sense, native food, I mean, allowing that tomatoes and potatoes are not native. Years. But there was a real movement around really changing the system from chefs in a really cultural agenda. I mean, it was quite amazing for me to see that. To see that. But the big issue for me was the style issue. You've done everything with style and panache. The ads, of which there are two or three more, aren't there? You know, just amazing. For on, I can't remember what you told me the budget was. It was next to nothing. You know, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Who was it? Someone else. Pass the either along. Camera, the conscious passing down the collective to the front. Say who you are. Hi, I'm Ruth Sorocco. I'm also a city um, alumni, and I run. Up, sorry, and I run Eat Club, a social enterprise as well. I wanted to ask two questions. First of all, about I mean, we all know that the system, the food system, is not doing very well. I wondered how you choose the topics that you decide to engage with is just based on stuff that you are personally interested in and also a little bit about the collaborative process about how you between the two of you or whoever it is you work with how you decide to engage and what kind of people you decide to engage with okay. um, well I we, we try to spend at least let's say about 50% of our time to, to our own projects so projects we initiate ourselves, so about subjects we really, like several told, angry about or confused or whatever. And the other 50% is because we get invited to do more vegetable campaigns or uh, to do more about food waste or to do a project. For instance, we did a project for five ministries in the Netherlands who wanted to reduce meat consumption. And then they invited us to, to come up with something that might help. So often it's because we get invited to do work as, as normal, just any company does, we get paid for it as well. And the other 50% we try to uh, devote to subjects we really uh, think are important. And yes, we often get the question, is it, isn't it difficult to decide for which companies to work or not? But to me, it's like this, the companies select their, their themselves they know if they have a good story or not. So actually, in, pract in practice, it doesn't happen a lot that a company we would never want to work for 
approaches us for to for a consultancy job or but anything else. So yeah, but I think the main reason for us to do the work is it has to be fun, um, and it has to be for a good cause, and then and then sometimes um, fun prevails, and sometimes the it is a good cause and it gets paid. But that's kind of so we, it would be great if we had 100% could decide our agenda for 100%. Um, it, it, we have our own projects, and then some projects we really do um, because we need, to get, we need to get paid as a company. But then there have to be projects that we really also enjoy doing because it's for a, yeah, yeah. a good cause. So but I think that's, that's important indeed, that, that we, it has to be fun. But also, in reaction to, to Martin, I think it's also important to, to us that the creative concept is right. So if there might be a subject we, we think is really important and might be fun as well to work on it, but if we can, can't com come up with a really good creative concept strategy, we won't no. be pressing. I, I think we're also really ba bad in writing big reports and stuff. So we, as a company, we started also writing reports. Shocking and then graduates <laughs> from Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> and then... <laughs> great reports would be useless. No, I never said that. No, we, we so we kind of, um, for instance, I, I also, also find it really uh, frustrating. So uh, just as an example, we were asked to write uh, uh, a kind of a new food policy for the Dutch uh, university kind of on how their ca or their catering policy and I think we wrote a, a good policy we made it a, a, we had a really good ideas about what they should do and then what happened nothing and then so then the Dutch ministry came and they said yeah could you help us to write a policy blah, blah, blah. and then we said no we will help you reduce because we've already written a policy and ne nothing happened and one of the main things that we said said in the policy was you should re reduce the amount of meat that you're serving. So we said, we will help you to do that, but then we want a, a practical, we want to really make a, as a practical thing, we will help you do it. So then we had five ministries in the Netherlands um, who, where we implemented the, uh, uh, the Meatless Monday, um, which was a lot of fun because we were working with the chefs, working with the people in the ministry, and actually doing something instead of just writing a report of what they, about what they could do. I that's think really that, about yeah. kind of. I think that's basically what our work is about. Often, Does that kind of. Answer your question, Ruth. Yeah, just and about the collaboration. Give give her the mic. Give the mic. About the collaboration. So the the key. No, yeah. So how do we work as a? Do you add people to your team? Or? Yes. No, now we have the luxury because we are a team, uh, ten sort of team, <laughs> ten uh, t uh, team London. members now. Yeah. Uh, we have different disciplines in our team, so we have someone who studied nutrition, we have somebody, someone who studied biology, uh, someone who, who had some experience at a campaigning agency, so all different kinds of experience are in the team now, and we both studied political science, so there's always a close link to policy making and politics as well. What about Martin's question about style? I think we have one, uh, that's one of the things that when we started the youth food movement, I think yeah. that we, we always had the feeling that if we're going to do this, we need to show that we are really serious about it and that we should um, invest in not only about kind of the knowledge and uh, the inspiration, but also kind of showing the world that we were here. So I remember our first dinner uh, that we organised as the YFM. where I, So we, we wanted to set up... A, a slow, a slow food group, a youth slow food group, which is now the YFM. And I said, all right, we, I just want to organize this massive dinner and people only, are, they're going to pay 25 euros and I'm going to make sure that we get all the food sponsored and the 25 euros will be their membership for slow food for a year. So that kind of was a bit of a trick to get, trick people to become a member of <laughs> slow food. Um, and we had this, and I always, I, yeah, we always said, we stuff to look good because you want people to get really inspired and to want to join and that is one of the ways that you can inspire people. Okay, question. At the back. I'll bring the mic. You're not allowed to speak until you've got the microphone. Say who you are. 
Hi there, I'm Michelle Zandelson from uh, Town Hamlet's Public Health and I was just thinking we were probably all desperate to know whether that had any impact or do you know whether that advertising campaign actually had an impact or you had any feedback about it? Or impact on whom? Well, impact on anything, yeah, exactly. <laughs> anything at all. Or oh, did it maybe increase fruit and veg even though it was just broccoli, mm. though it, like with the, fr with the soft drinks and you show Coca-Cola and people have other ones. Did, so it, did it increase it generally I'll or do you know that or not? Well, I couldn't ex exactly say what the impact is. We know kind of what the media out kind of reach was. So it was a, uh, I don't know now, but it was. Yeah, over, you know? over two and a half million people. So over two and a half million people uh, knew ab know about this campaign. Um, which is impact because people have were thinking about w what is go kind of what out of the Netherlands population of 15, 15, 15 million. That's so. quite a high reach. Yeah. yeah. So and then and then what the other and other and impact is that it was actually discussed in news programs, kind of um, how kind of a world is a bit yeah. it, it, <laughs> um, crooked in the way that kind of we're spending millions on. Uh, anti-obesity programs and we're spending billions on uh, obesity programs as uh, if we were to c call these campaigns this but um so there, there was something happening in the in the public debate um, and we had the impact that now there was a the, the, the there's a, a kale organization in America kale is very big in the in the Netherlands kale is very dull who are doing uh, asked us to do a campaign. The Dutch potato farmers asked us to do a campaign. So people are rethinking kind of what they can do to to market healthy food, which is impact. But what it exactly is, I don't know. And I was also wondering, will you use some of the um, the advertising logo, yeah. if you like, not logo, but the sayings of some of these really big companies? Did you get any lawyers ringing you up saying? <laughs> I had my own lawyer who <laughs> rang me up and said, you, you are Can't a fool. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had, um, so I, I had a sleepless night about this because we, I first said, oh, it's not going to be a problem. And then I, just the day before we were going to release the film, I looked at it one more time and I thought, oh, this is going to be a problem. So then my lawyer called, I sent it to my lawyer, said, will this be a problem? And she said, yes, it will be a problem. I wouldn't do it. And I was like, no, we, we are going to do it. We didn't hear anything. Nobody except of there's um we also had a big poster made which had a vodafone kind of broccoli the power of you uh ad and we got a very nice email of vodafone that they thought it was a great initiative so we were <laughs> well, but they were a, not a food company that's a so disaster yeah <laughs> yes that's, that's did they give you any money yes. no <laughs> did they give you any money no no Hi, I'm Michael Davies. I started a social enterprise called Cookability, teach kids how to cook, make decisions about what to eat. Coming back to the title of your presentation, which is really interesting, um, Transition by Doing, I'm just wondering in summary, or if you reflect a little bit on how you think you, you're, you're changing things, and, and how you, you had this model in the beginning, which is interesting, yeah. and you talked about in influencing you know, the, the powers that be and the status quo. Yeah. And get them. I, I kind of get the feeling get them on board, etc., to affect change. What What are the lessons you've learned? What What's been successful? How would you inspire us or encourage us to um, endeavor to to make that happen? Yeah. Um, well, what I found very inspirational myself was that kind of working working with young professionals. Um, so the kind of the academy was, I think, a very powerful concept. The kind of grabbing young people who are going to start a, 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 a career in food and really make them feel that they are in charge of what is going to happen uh, for the coming years because kind of generations above us will stop doing what they do within 10, 20, 30 years, but they will still be in charge maybe. So kind of that, for me, that was one of, that was very inspirational to see kind of how people uh, with more knowledge and a, uh, and a good network um, of, of people in uh, places that can actually influence companies, policies um, that really work. Um, and yeah. yeah. Well, 
Um, actually, your your question is what 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 would you advise us as a strategy for change, right? Uh, yes. We can reformulate it in that way. I think the most important thing we try to do, because I wouldn't ever say that we are the most knowledgeable people with regard to the food system and agriculture. So, but what we try to do is to sh show that by the projects we are doing, we are actually doing stuff, and that makes us more credible to like the big companies. Because of course, there are a lot of people with ideas what's bad about like advertisement and what's healthier food to eat, but by actually making our own campaigns and by starting our own projects, I think that makes us um, yes more credible as a, as a as a partner and make, makes it easier to com come into contact and start building a relationship. That, that's the most important thing, I guess. Does that give you what you want? Can I, can I add one more sentence into that? Kind of, I think connecting people, I really believe in the power of kind of con connecting people who are in the kind of, yeah, uh, ground, uh, what's it, grassroots movement to people who are working in big companies. And um, I think that is what we often get back from the projects that we work in, is that people kind of, in, in your daily, daily practice, if you're working in the ministry or in a big company, you're really not really looking around and, and not talking to people who are looking at the world in a very different way um, and kind of really try to every day connect people to each other and get people to look at yeah, the, the world in a different way it tends to work. Yeah, I'm Tony Allen from King's College. I'm a water scientist and I come to these meetings because I have learned that food is uh, how we interact with nature <laughs> and water is part of that. So I'm a happy subordinate to food. Um, but uh, when I, we come to the end or towards the end of a session like this, um, you know, inside my ears start to th or my head starts to think, it's the neoliberal system, stupid. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. so when I come to the end of a long career, it's still what I think, it's the neoliberal system. And doing something about it is something that we all need to do. So I just wondered, you introduced yourself as someone that was uh, committed to food in your early life and then the Netherlands and then uh, get to the university age and you started <coughs> to do politics. Uh, could you tell us um, your brush with politics? Did it not lead you to this conclusion that <sighs> it's the power relations, it's the politics, what we need actually is a revolution? Yeah, I've, that's kind <laughs> of... Um, yeah, uh, I think a lot of the problems that we are talking about won't be served, maybe, or won't be solved until we all have a revolution or a massive crisis and rethink the whole system. I, and, but I think it's also, um, yeah, I, I think you're right. <laughs> I can Go back, P push Tony Allen's point. Get your, your system structure map up again. Talk well, us I also like your diagram. Talk, yeah, that's, that's, take us back to that. Do people know this? No. no? Okay. no. no. All right, so it's basically a, 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 um, a model that shows how change can work. And this is the system. And there is pressure on the system from landscape development so big, um, yeah, big changing landscape can be resor resources finishing. It can be uh, public uh, demanding something totally different. It can be, um, it's something that the system can't do a lot about. It's just what is happening. And there's pressure from these technological, and I want to add social niches um, um, on the system. So the, the system is being pressured. And within the system, there's a lot of people who also actually want to change the system and who I really believe, and that's, uh, maybe that's what we are trying to do, trying to reach those people and get them within the system to change things. But we are still working within the system. So do you want to? Yeah, I think if, if you look at this, this uh, diagram, it show, to me it sh at least it shows that the point 
Tony is making, I guess, is that you can try to change this, the regime a little bit, but if this isn't changing, the, the really landscape development, and I mean, if you still look at the system from this neoliberal neo paradigm, the, we won't be pushing the regime to change from both up and down. And there, uh, of course, the impact will, will be more limited than if you only try to push it from the downside. So, yes, that's at least this. It's a, uh, when, when you put it up, Sam, I was struggling to remember my pea brain who did this. And I can't remember who did it. It wasn't Rotman's. It was Rotman's, it was John Rotman's. Green, Rotman's, and. Rotman's. Yeah. We, I mean, we'll do, we're not here to discuss this diagram, but there's been much discussion about it, about whether it's. I mean, it's very, like all good diagrams, it captures something very important that one can see rich things in. I mean, the argument is that these and that are actually in this as well. That's, yeah. that's one criticism of the, of the model. Uh, and the other is that what Tony Allen from King's College, our water guru, uh, was pointing out is actually is neoliberalism, neoliberalism would, as it were, be under this. It's a theory. It's a policy. It's a, but that's actually shaped everything. That's, that's the argument. So the... the I mean, I like yeah. Rotman's work, and I, I like this. I like diagrams that are simple, but it doesn't cover everything. No, no, it's Rotman's just and no, all the people who, who did this, no one would say this diagram actually captures it. But for us as academics, and you as political graduates of an inferior university in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. uh, would know only to us, a very good university, very nice city, um, uh, they, they would well know this is the sort of thing all the politics argues about. Uh, and in food, this is, I'm now going to ask you to a question, picking up on Tony Allen. In food, we don't have good equivalents of this model. And there's a sense in which I think the, I take Tony Allen's comment as saying as, what the food research collaboration ought to be maybe coming, beginning to ask our academics uh, is saying, well, you know, can we come up with better diagrams than this? I've spent 40 years trying to come up with better diagrams. And they're very hard. It's very hard to do a diagram. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of uh, what you two and your colleagues have been doing, you're actually trying <coughs> to change culture to transform that yeah. in Tony Allen's point of view. Are you thinking at all about applying your creativity into modifying that diagram, to coming up with something that's more accurate in describing it? And that's not to knock mm -hmm. that. I've always yeah. liked that diagram. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think it's quite funny because on, only this morning we were talking about another project. It's 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 called Floating Farm. We're doing so we are trying to w with others, but develop a, like a yeah. The word describes it actually pretty well. So it's a farm, but it's floating. So and we were we we were working it's on this. The but well, th this project is more about okay showing. We don't only want to talk about innovation, but we want to do it in a, in a surrounding from, from um, we want to actually create something that is innovative and not only be talking about it. So, but I won't go into detail about this project, but we were, it's, we are just at the beginning of it. So we were working on, a, on the communication strategy and really try to get the essence for ourselves clearly. And so we, we took this model and we tried to change it. No, we actually trying to fit the project into the model. So where are we working at? Uh, is this is this a uh, is this a technological niche project we are trying to do? do or, but actually this is quite a big project. So there are a lot of there's also some sponsoring from the bigger organizations. So is this a uh, regime project or so yeah, we are, we are working with the model sometimes but what we didn't do is try to develop a new model that might be more accurate. Well, I, think, I think it's a good challenge. <laughs> I think you should. Yeah. And I think 
you know, Tony Allen comes here and people who come and we're having these wonderful fruit thinkers sessions. Uh, uh, and I think this is a theme that is coming out a lot. What actually is the model of change? There are many models of change. Yeah. Okay, we all know that. You know that. Um, but and we haven't got an equivalent. Although Rodman's has has worked a little bit on food, uh, there's we haven't got something neat or a variety right. of models, and we should do that. Yeah, and I think this this clearly shows that we are using this for too long now. Yeah. Tony, as ever, you asked to put, let it always, with him, always ask a question back. Um, uh, does that answer at all get to you? You were saying it's neoliberal system, stupid. They're saying, well, we're experimenting, we're trying. I'm summarizing. Yeah, I, I, I know it from the water point of view, because the neoliberal system has created accounting systems which are highly respected. They've got much you know, smarter people than us in terms of suits and so on, <coughs> running accounting systems, both within the corporations as well as auditing them. So that system is locked into a financial accounting system, which um, ignores all the things that you're caring about, nutrition and so on, and all the things I care about, which is the, the value of water and how it could be better conserved and better stewarded, but there's not a not a cent or uh, a drachma of, of incentive to get that system to look across at the stewardship or look across at the nutrition. So, I mean, it, it's very basic stuff. We've, we've got accounting, that neoliberal system has evolved uh, to be an exquisite, exquisitely blind to you know, yeah. your interests and my water interests. It's, it's, there it is, and that to get them to see that they should do it uh, no, how do you uh, just think how Coke responds to the sugar thing? I, I just been you know, waiting for a bus there and saw, you know, the, the Diet Coke, um, uh, um, Coke Zero, Green, and then classic, of course, at the beginning, you know, bravely presenting choice and somehow getting sugar down. But when I asked uh, one of the senior cook people in their CSR. They now call them sustainability departments. Yeah. Uh, you know, why did you, you know, launch those uh, other beverages? And she said, the NGO, so people like you. Yeah. So the campaigning that people like you do, uh, especially if you can do it brilliantly, like uh, occasionally they do the, the, the Kit Kat thing for Nestle, and um, obviously somehow it gets through to the heart of the Coke and the beverage people as well on sugar. So we just got to keep doing that. But my, I, I, yes, it's clear we've got to do that, but my, my wish is to get the accounting system reforms. Mm. Yeah. Let's, let's, how could, I'll, I'll, <coughs> I'll, I know Tony Allen well enough to translate his complex thinking to a simple question, uh, <laughs> which is, Sorry? I know you well enough to take your complex ideas and to a simple question, I'm going to translate it. How can you, how can you account, he's laughing, how can you account for culture? That's, in a sense, what Tony's question. That's a really big question for you. You think? Yeah. Um, and you. <laughs> That's what it becomes. I have to think as well. well, well yes, the, the people that make their money uh, in that supply chain uh, obey the rules. There isn't a rule saying think about culture, think about water, think about nutrition. Yeah, uh, but I, I, it's a hard I, it's, I think it's a very hard question, and I think we can change culture a little bit, and I think we can trans can transform culture. But I think we have a very, very, very big opponent, and I think we've got a uh, we have created a system in which I sometimes get very, I can get very cynical about it. I can get very, uh, if I'm looking at the small things that I can do, I get very enthusiastic. And then if I look at the big world and all the challenges that we have, I can only hope that there's a lot of people like us who want to help uh, do something. And I, I for, for, for me at this point, I wouldn't know how to kind of knock down the system and w where the revolution should start. But then when I look around at kind of the people young entrepreneurs starting new businesses who are doing things in, in another way, young people who are really 
uh, trying to, within the organisation, people that we work with within the regime, who I really believe might help us change yeah. the, the organisations. But yeah, please, because I find it. Well, no, I want to push Tony's point further. How do you account for it? I mean, the mm -hmm. advertising world, the marketing world, mm -hmm. the consumer culture world, as you as political mm -hmm. scientists know this, has done a huge amount of research on mm -hmm. mapping our minds. Mm -hmm. Yep. They do tracking all the time cool. of us, what we're thinking, yep. so yep. But Tony raised the key point that comes out of that tracking, choice. At the heart of the neoliberal model is the belief that choice is God. Mm. What do you do about that? Well, that's, that's, that's a good question. Can I just make a little detour? <laughs> detour. I think there's a direct relation between culture and m money and uh, if you look at the figures like like 60 years ago we, s we s at least in the Netherlands we spent about 50 percent of our income on food now it's only 11 percent so this this only changed because the culture changed and in, the, in our culture now we find other things important and technology and technology changed so and of course because there was a lot of adf advertising and choice editing. and So I think there's no question if there's a relation between culture and money. So of course working on culture is also working on changing the choices people make and of course try to uh, make sure that more money is flowing to the food system so it can develop into a more sustainable system because to in my, op my opinion if we keep spending 11 percent of our income to, to food we won't we just can't expect to be to be the system to be really sustainable it's just That's not possible so for you to give to the Dutch public we don't keep walking away from it. <laughs> 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 I have this effect on everybody. 